World War Kaiju takes a wild spin on the Cold War era, swapping out nukes for something way more colossal, giant monsters. Imagine a world where the discovery of radioactive crystals leads to the birth of these towering creatures, setting off a monster arms race between superpowers. The story has a unique narrative for a comic, an interview between an intelligence agent and a truth-seeking reporter, giving us a glimpse into a history altered by kaijus. In this reimagined history, Tokyo faces destruction instead of Hiroshima, and the atom bomb is just a footnote, never really developed. While these changes are significant, the core of society and the broader strokes of history still mirror our own Cold War realities. But hey, that's not the main draw here. World War Kaiju is a heartfelt homage to the kaiju genre, and those cheesy yet charming mid-20th century sci-fi flicks. Artist McAvoy nails this vibe with the visuals mixing in everything from sly Martians to valiant scientists, not to mention a plethora of monsters to feel like they've stumped right out of a classic Pacific Rim cinema. So let's get started with exploring this comic, shall we? But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you and let's begin. In the beginning, in an alternate twist of history where the path of war merged with myth and monstrosity, the world witnesses a different kind of August 6, 1945. It's a night when the skies are heavy with the thrum of bomber planes, not with atomic dread, but with suspense for unleashing a different form of destruction. Imagine the Enola Gay, its silhouette etched against the moonlit canvas above, but it is not carrying a nuclear bomb, but a secret weapon of biblical proportions. Instead of a nuclear weapon, a kaiju is used as a weapon, referred to as Fat Man, which was one of the actual code names for the atomic bombs used during World War II. And it is this monster that's brought to Japan instead of the fury of a nuclear bomb. The kaiju, also known as Ryujin, until now emerges from the sea, a creature of immense power and destruction, hearkening back to the Japanese folklore of a dragon god of the sea. The Americans knew that the creature would bring havoc, but they were unaware of the magnitude. The release of this towering lizard onto Tokyo's shores was done with a singular purpose, to undermine the enemy's morale through unprecedented destruction. The kaiju, far from a mindless beast, showed unexpected levels of cunning and ferocity, commandeering the implements of human warfare to enhance its rampage. The city is set ablaze, and the military's defenses are trampled under its might, which leaves traditional combat obsolete. As the kaiju's onslaught intensifies, we learn about the fatigue and desire for peace among the Japanese people. However, nationalistic pride precludes surrender, so despite hating the war, they are forced to participate in it. The art, which juxtaposes the kaiju's destruction with the ethos of the samurai, suggests a cultural dichotomy, with a tussle between historical honor and the brutal realities of modern conflict. In the aftermath of the kaiju attack on Tokyo, the city succumbs to chaos. The Japanese authority collapses and it takes two days for the American forces to find any leadership to surrender, as most are either diseased or in hiding due to the kaiju-induced devastation. The comic frames this through the perspective of a CIA operative named Hampton, who is being interviewed by a journalist named Keegan. Their conversation reveals the first-hand horror and the widespread destruction that gripped Tokyo in the wake of the rampage. Keegan, skeptical at first, is promised shocking revelations about the government's handling of the kaiju and its broader implications, including the secrets withheld from the public. The events of August 6 led to an arms race that has evolved beyond nuclear weapons in the world of these colossal creatures. The implication is that the world is now on the brink of a new kind of war, one where kaiju are the harbingers of destruction in a conflict that could overshadow the devastation of World War II. One of the panels shows a scene from Siberia in 1949. A mushroom cloud rises, but of course it is because of the hatching of a kaiju crystal and not from a nuclear test which suggests Russia's entry into this terrifying new arms race. After the catastrophic events in Tokyo, discussions began about the unbelievable science behind kaiju, which brought to light the crystals buried for eons, which gave rise to the destructive creatures. Hampton recounts the early attempts and failures in kaiju creation, including an embarrassing incident with a kaiju named Little Boy. He reveals the staggering capabilities of the Soviets in producing kaiju outpacing American efforts. The dialogue touches on the lack of credence of such scientific advances given the era's limited technological understanding. We also learn about Project Fenris, where Nazi scientists attempted to harness kaiju during World War II. These endeavors, which later influenced American research, failed to produce a viable kaiju weapon before being halted by an Allied raid. 
Hampton dismisses Keegan's idealistic views, arguing the necessity of kaiju weapons in the face of Soviet opposition. The CIA operative then speaks about President Eisenhower and his tryst with a kaiju arms race and its experience with a kaiju named Mudra, who made a plea for peace at the United Nations. Modra tried to influence global diplomacy even as leaders remained skeptical of such an unconventional messenger of peace, and that was that. Hampton spins tales of political machinations, cover-ups, and ruthless utilitarianism that led to cities like Manhattan and Los Angeles becoming battlegrounds for these colossal entities. President Eisenhower and his hardline stance against Kaiju, particularly Modra, who attempted to broker a truce at the United Nations only to be met with fierce resistance and the unleashing of another monster razor beat by the military. Public sentiment and media narratives were swayed by the aftermath of these events with the scapegoating of Mudra and the collateral damage inflicted by Razorbeak's intervention. Commercial exploitation followed with children's toys, replicating the kaiju battles which blended the monsters into the fabric of pop culture. But then Hampton drops the bomb, revealing the existence of pixies and a prehistoric alien civilization called the Zyox. This ancient and advanced civilization lived among the stars long before humans walked the Earth. Their scientific knowledge and inventions were significantly superior to those of Earth. However, the Zyox became embroiled in internal conflicts leading to a war that devastated their planet, known as Planet 10, which ultimately turned into a barren wasteland. The Zyox saw the error of their ways after much death and suffering. In an act of repentance and foresight, they decided to prevent such destruction from occurring elsewhere. They chose to trap their deadliest creations, the Kaiju, they created as weapons in transmorphic energy crystals. These crystals served as a containment method for the monsters, which secured the creatures away from causing further havoc. The Zyox then chose Earth, which they deemed a primitive world, as the repository of these crystals. Despite everything, Keegan is not willing to believe this interviewee, so Hampton asks him to talk to a famous astronomer called Carl Sagan about something called Project Majestic. Science Task Force Go the second part of the story begins with Keegan meeting Dr. Sagan, an academic with surprising ties to the military, particularly the Air Force. This points him towards the clandestine activities of the government and academia. In 1952, a meeting was held between Secretary of State Atchison and Dr. Sagan where they deliberated on how the U.S. should respond if flying saucers were proven to be extraterrestrial. This discussion, taking place after the Modra incident, showed the government's serious consideration of alien life. Meanwhile, a rift develops between the U.S. administration and the CIA hinting at internal conflicts and possibly divergent agendas or secrets within the government. Hampton reveals the CIA's culture of secrecy, which gets more pronounced because he would more than often say, I can neither confirm nor deny. This indicates a deep web of unacknowledged activities and operations. Further tensions are revealed in the White House with an alleged physical altercation between President Eisenhower and CIA Director Alan Dulles. This is compounded by political complexities and Alan's influential connections. The existence of classified files in excess even to the president reflects a significant breach of trust within the government, exacerbated by the Manhattan event. Hampton recounts moving from a field agent to a desk job after witnessing an unprecedented event that is a battle between two kaijus. Eventually, the authorities established the Kaiju Science Task Force, a project initiated by President Eisenhower to study and potentially combat kaiju warfare. Hampton is recruited to the Kaiju Science Task Force, a decision influenced by politics and the interests of powerful figures like Prescott Bush an important campaign contributor. Hampton's presence in the task force is justified as being the CIA's leading kaiju expert, though he humorously downplays his expertise. The story also introduces Doc Tsubaraya from Hiroshima University and a leading figure in kaiju studies. Working with Tsubaraya, described as a Nobel Prize winning genius, is likened to being caught in a shit tornado straight to Oz. Tsubaraya's contributions include the development of advanced anti-kaiju technologies like the Type 88 Tesla tank and a jump sized bear trap. The Kaiju Science Task Force during the 1950s focused on discovering and exterminating various naturally occurring kaiju that plagued Earth. However, Keegan questions Hampton's role, suspecting it to be a part of a power struggle between CIA Director Dulles and the President. Hampton reveals a deeper layer of secrets, indicating that the task force work, including the elimination of rogue monsters, masks a pursuit of hidden kaiju secrets. The story takes a darker turn with the mention of James Forrestal, the first Secretary of Defense who allegedly knew the truth about the men from Mars, aliens who contacted humans and intended to go to public before his untimely death described as a fall from a window at the Naval Medical Center in Bethesda. Hampton defends the CIA's earlier operations under Admiral Hillen Coder, 
suggesting that the agency's more nefarious activities began under Dulles' leadership. The discussion then shifts to Hampton's own role in the task force and the implications of his involvement, with Keegan expressing distrust and skepticism about Hampton's intentions and actions. Keegan confronts Hampton, demanding straightforward answers about the Kaiju Science Task Force. He expresses frustration with Hampton's evasive tactics and seeks the truth about the task force's real mission. Hampton suggests that he has not lied, but suggests that Keegan might not be asking the right question. When pressed about the behind-the-scenes activities and his role as a CIA mole within the KST, Hampton admits his desire to leave the job, indicating discomfort with his role or the nature of the work. The conversation then shifts to a significant discovery in Barrow, Alaska, where a USGS survey team found a kaiju reminiscent of prehistoric woolly mammoths preserved in ice from the last ice age. Hampton reveals that alongside a kaiju, something else was discovered, a large metal object referred to as the artifact. This discovery seemed to alarm the CIA, but the details about the artifact remain unclear as Hampton never saw it himself. The plot thickens when Hampton describes arriving at the site only to find that everyone in the nearby area, including rig workers, geologists, and local residents, had mysteriously disappeared. Houses were left as if the occupants had vanished in an instant with lights still on and cars abandoned mid-use. This eerie scenario puzzles Keegan, who questions the logistics of such an event. Hampton concludes with a philosophical musing of the nature of truth, suggesting that it does not have to conform to what is commonly accepted as possible or real. He implies that the truth might be far stranger than fiction, which is constrained by the need to make sense. The conversation ends on an ambiguous note, with Keegan expressing skepticism about the likelihood of such extraordinary revelations. The dialogue intensifies between Keegan and Hampton, delving deeper into the mysterious and possibly otherworldly aspects of their discussion. Hampton claims that extraterrestrials prefer Utah for its volcanic soil, which he says resembles the ancient terrain of Mars before it became a desolate dust bowl. This revelation leaves Keegan bewildered and skeptical, questioning whether Hampton's narrative is a well-rehearsed act or an impromptu performance. Hampton, in response, challenges Keegan's understanding of reality. He asserts that the secrets Keegan seek are hidden in plain sight and that his investigative efforts are misguided. Hampton hints at a transformed America where no honest election has occurred since 1968 and warns of an impending war if the current course is not altered. Frustrated, Keegan decides to take control of the conversation. He demands that Hampton explains the pivotal moment that changed him from a conventional government official into someone who believes in these extraordinary claims. Keegan's insistence on a straightforward answer from Hampton indicates a shift in their dynamic, with Keegan now directing the interrogation to uncover the truth behind Hampton's transformation and the larger hidden realities he alludes to. And that's where the issue ends. Marvelous verdict, World War Kaiju threw a bit of a curveball that had me scratching my head. So these kaiju making crystals, they're actually alien leftovers? Apparently the alien race done with their own kaiju wars decided Earth was the best dumping ground for these dangerous crystals. The comic makes it clear that these crystals could be damaged and destroyed, rendering them useless for kaiju hatching. So why go through the hassle of shipping them off to Earth? Wouldn't it be simpler to just destroy them? Feels like a missed opportunity for an easy fix like, why not toss them into the nearest star or a black hole? Now I get it, no crystals, no kaiju, no story, and maybe there's a bigger plan unfolding in the upcoming issues that'll patch this up. But for now, it's a little wrinkle in an otherwise engaging tale. Plot holes aside, World War Kaiju is still a solid recommendation for me. It's a fun twist on 50 sci-fi loaded with all the giant monster action you could ever want. I'm definitely keeping an eye out for the next installment to see where this monster mashup heads next. And for those who love diving deep, the appendices at the back are a treasure trove. They're filled with details that not only add depth to the story, but also serve up some genuinely funny moments with their earnestness. It's a unique blend of alternate history and monster mayhem wrapped up in a package that's a nod to a beloved cinematic era. If you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.